Welcome back to the Fixed Ops Roundtable. Leonard Belavia is the founding partner at Belavia Blatt PC, dealerlaw.com, a great friend of the dealer, great friend of the Fixed Ops community. Len, welcome back to the Fixed Ops Roundtable. Ted, it's always great to be with you. Thanks for inviting me back. Len, we got a lot happening. Here we are, mid-November, coming into the holidays. There's been a lot of things in the news this year. I want to talk to you. I want to pick your brain on a couple things. First, um, on the manufacturer side, um, you know, just a little while back, uh, we got the news in terms of what Ford is going to require dealers to do on the EV side. And I know I've seen different things where you have weighed in on that. What are um, what are some of your thoughts? Well. You know, it was interesting to see how that whole saga unfolded, because before Ford had all its dealers out in Vegas, you know, all the headlines were about direct sales and um, minimal involvement of dealers and fixed pricing and a whole host of things that got dealers very concerned. And then, you know, people like you and I and other attorneys that specialize in this area weighed in and then dealer associations uh, weighed in. So it probably is not a coincidence that Ford backed off of that. And uh, although they created a whole other problem, which is the dollar investment that they're asking dealers for, they seem to have abandoned the notion of selling direct to consumers. So um, my hats are off to the ATAEs and dealer council and, and, and your show for enlightening um, dealers on what they should be thinking and how they should approach this. Uh, but the, the franchise laws in all 50 states essentially prohibited Ford and others that were thinking along those same lines from selling direct to consumers. So um, I, I think in part Ford was testing the resolve of dealers and they saw the pushback was overwhelming from dealer associations who fe effectively said, look, if this is what you're intending to roll out, expect major pushback. And I'm sure in, in the boardrooms, there were some discussions so that by the time everyone got together in Vegas, they pretty much departed from that. Uh, strategy, although they opened up this whole idea of having dealers invest in an infrastructure of, in some cases, over a million dollars. And if you're a Ford and a Lincoln dealer, it's over $2 million. So it's caused dealers to sit back and say, well, let's see, there's a 5% market share for EVs right now. That includes Tesla. So if you take Tesla off of that, you know, it's probably 3%. And everything a dealer does, I mean, they're they're obligated to their shareholders, whether it's the dealer and his wife or his family or a board or if it's a private equity group, you know, investors, they have a fiduciary obligation to make smart financial decisions. And usually that's based on return on investment. So how do you justify a two million dollar investment if you're a Ford Lincoln dealer for a an electric vehicle that may not really see the, the light of day and true you know, market share uh, parlance, if you will, uh, for 10 years or more? And I, you know, I've, I've listened to people on your show, Ted, that have you know, prognosticated about when EVs will really have a meaningful share in the marketplace. You know, some people will tell you five to seven years, other 10 to 15 years. Uh, some, you know, have a more cynical view. So mm -hmm. you put all that together and you ask a Lincoln and Ford dealer to write a check for $2 million. Uh, I don't know. And I've spoken to plenty of you know, my clients and I don't not, none of them are raising their hand to do that. I mean, publicly, they may talk the talk so that they sound like they're cooperating. But when the day comes, which has been pushed off, interestingly, by Ford into uh, another month or so, uh, I'm sure to measure the response. And I know Ford is out there in droves meeting with their dealers. And the intel that I'm getting is that there has not been an overwhelming positive response by dealers. So uh, that's why I say, you know, these things aren't as... Um, important as some people make it seem because ultimately manufacturers have to do what's best in terms of gaining market share and retaining market share so if these things are going to fall flat then you know presumably ford will retrench and and reconfigure you know how they're going to introduce evs to the marketplace uh, there are bigger and more pressing issues that dealers in my opinion have to face and i think it ties in perfectly That's with you know fixed ops personnel because you know I, the next the next issue for fixed ops people to confront is over the air updates or right. vehicle connectivity and you know that's something that is a that's learning coming, curve. Len. 
Yeah, that, I mean, that, you know what, no matter what the prognosticators say, that is that is here and that is coming rapidly. And there's no, I don't think there's too many deniers on that. So I want to talk to you today about those connected vehicles, those over-the-air updates, because um, Steve Greenfield did a segment here on the Roundtable, Automotive Ventures, and he talked about it last time as well. That is coming, and there are billions of dollars now that are going to be at stake that are going to be collected, and uh, who's going to get those? What is the dealer's share? Is there a dealer's share? And it will likely impact, we're hearing, the way dealers are staffed from here on in. So a lot of implications on this over-the-air update, Len. Yeah, I, I, and this is very timely, uh, Ted. I I would uh, you know deputize your fixed ops audience here to really try and educate the dealers and the decision makers at the dealership because th this is really foreboding and, and Stellantis and GM have, have already announced even as far back as a year ago that they expect that this over the air update um, transition will generate about $25 billion a year to these manufacturers. Now, billions, where, billions. Where, billions, not millions. Uh, each year. Now multiply that by each manufacturer. Where is that money coming from? It's coming out of the hide of the fixed ops departments of these dealerships. So this is really a call to action by dealers who should inform their state association uh, personnel and their 20 groups and dealer council, because um, if it's not stopped, and now we're starting to see state dealer associations actually pass legislation or introduce legislation to try and put a reasonable framework together so that manufacturers don't just raid the cookie jar of all the franchise dealers in the country by trying to take this service department business and deal direct with consumers. Now, to, to, to try and oversimplify this, and I, I'm sure your audience is somewhat aware of this, but consider your cell phone, right? We're all used to having over the air updates. You know, you wake up and you see that your phone is updating. Well, not so easy with a car. Now, uh, the two states that I think are out front on this is, are West Virginia and uh, most recently New Jersey has introduced a bill. But just to give you an example, um, I don't think anyone quarrels with the idea that consumers, you know, all of these technological advances should be consumer friendly. So no one is trying to erode, the, you know, the idea that consumers should be able to get rudimentary updates. So, for example, the infotainment system or the navigation system, if the manufacturer wants to change the color of an icon or improve um, you know, one of the applications, there's no need to take the car into the service department for something so innocuous. But there are some over the air upgrades that do involve the underlying functionality of the vehicle. For example, the braking system or uh, certain safety and security features such as uh, lane change warnings, th things that really go to the heart of the operation of the vehicle. Uh, Tesla has tried to do that yeah. over the air, and they've been given somewhat of a free pass. And I think that's more political in nature and not regulatory. But, you know, if, if a manufacturer wants to put a car out there, they have to go through regulatory hurdles to make sure every component of the car is working in accordance with manufacturer specifications. So who is a manufacturer to say, all right, we passed that. Now, a month later, we're going to change the braking system. And on a you're vehicle. right. Tesla got a pass on that big time because I didn't hear anything about any, any compliance with any regulation to do that. And it opened a lot of eyes at the OEMs. And now we're talking the potential of, like, like you said, all these many billions of dollars. Well, you know, Tesla gets a free pass. This is more a political discussion than anything else. You know, regulators, I'm sure, like everybody else, are afraid to look like they're not consumer friendly. But if a legacy manufacturer uh, plans on doing something that's going to impair the, the underlying structural integrity of a vehicle, then they had better make sure that they comply with all regulatory mandates. So that's an argument in favor of having certain upgrades done at the dealership. And it, the best example that I could think of is, you know, the manufacturers, if you read their literature, will say, well, don't worry, all these over the air updates are going to be done at three o'clock in the morning when you're sleeping, or if you prefer during the day when you're in the office. But what happens when a manufacturer is attempting to re-regulate the braking system in the car and at 3 a.m., one morning, you're taking your wife to deliver a baby or you're going to an emergency room, and now the vehicle is in the middle of an upgrade, and that could adversely affect the functionality of the braking system. 
So, you know, there's an example of why that type of an upgrade should be performed at a dealership because the car is going to be delivered, returned to the consumer safely with the upgrade of 100% completed. So trade associations have to be willing to advocate for those type of repairs to be done at the dealership and make the point that this is not to be anti-consumer or pro-dealer in terms of you know, revenue raising. It's just in the best interest of the consumers that some of the more serious upgrades be done under the guidance of a, tech, you know, a technician who's trained and not over the air where there can be some problems. So West Virginia and New Jersey have, have tackled that. You know, New Jersey has effectively said, if you're going to do those type of updates uh, for, for items that are already in the vehicle. So for example, if a vehicle comes and a customer purchases it with heating seats, heated seats mm -hmm. or uh, lane change warnings, you can't charge a customer for the manufacturer to flick on the switch. That's, that's uh, double billing, right? That's, they paid, the customer paid for the car with those items in it, presumably it's in the MSRP. Yes, yes. So to charge the customer again, to turn on the app that implements that feature in the vehicle is charging the customer twice. So it's really a deceptive trade practice prohibition mm -hmm. that New Jersey is addressing. And in West Virginia, you know, they were the pioneer on this. They actually passed this legislation that said that if a customer, and there were many customers who don't feel comfortable doing an over the air update. So to the extent they go to their dealer, which many will and say, can you assist me with pro reprogramming this feature on my car? Um, then the dealer should be compensated just like it was performing a warranty service. So while it sounds kind of bait manufacturers have taken a very simplistic view of this. Well, how could dealers complain about this? You know, this is all in the interest, interest of enhancing the customer experience. Well, it's really not. It's really not because to the extent that you're encroaching on consumer safety, then what's in the best interest of the consumer is to have certified technicians perform the upgrade and the dealer get paid to make sure that the upgrade is being performed in accordance with, you know, specification, regulatory specifications. So there's a whole lot that meets the eye here. And I think fixed ops people have to explain to their dealers that this is going to, it's bad enough that EVs have, you know, 60% less moving parts. So, you know, mm -hmm. there are a lot of people that are concerned about what that will mean uh, to the gross profit in the service department. By the way, on that note, you know, there are many people who think that EVs will present an even better opportunity um, right. in terms of fixed ops because warranty uh, revenues will increase if a battery needs to be changed, right? If the, if the battery costs $6,000, then a dealer should be getting over $10,000 to replace that part under warranty. So, um, it's not necessarily a problem, you know, to have EVs, uh, flooded, have the service department, you know, servicing EVs, but more than that is dealers have to be aware that manufacturers are looking to take a bite out of their, uh, warranty revenues by having these over the air updates. So there's a whole host of things that state associations should be addressing now before this get, gains traction and New Jersey and West Virginia are leaders in that regard. And I would suspect that uh, state associations are going to be calling their legal advisors to figure out, you know, what should be put in place before consumers are negatively impacted. Len, you always give us great reminders as to the basics and fundamentals in our industry. Everybody, Len Belavia is the dealer's attorney. All right. And, you know, what you were mentioning earlier, I cannot imagine those OEMs earlier in that conversation would have wanted to walk into a courtroom and see Len Belavia on the other side. Um, you do a magnificent job. I know you work with a lot of dealers that uh, attend and are involved with the conference. And uh, Len Belavia, everybody, uh, this is what he does. He is His family has been in the automotive business. And Len, it's very refreshing to get your commentary on what's current. And uh, you know, on behalf of the Fixed Ops community, I appreciate that very much. Well, never a dull moment, Ted. There's always something to talk about, as you know. Uh, and as long as there are manufacturers and dealers, I don't think we'll be at a loss to figure out what to discuss. Len, I want to wish you and your family a happy Thanksgiving. And uh, again, thank you for all that you do for automotive uh, retail. Thank you, Ted. Happy Thanksgiving to you and your family as well. Len Belavia, everybody, the founding partner from Belavia Blatt, dealerlaw.com. 
reach out to him, uh, make an acquaintance. Uh, I assure you it'll be a great one to have. Len Belavia here at the Fixed Ops Roundtable.